Okay. Hi, all. Welcome to the fourth and final session of the Virtual National Adaptation Forum series responding to climate amplified extreme weather events. My name is Carrie Schaefer, and I am the project coordinator for the National Adaptation Forum. I'm going to give a brief introduction here, and then we will go ahead and start our session. To begin, I would like to thank our sponsor, the CO2 Foundation, for their support of this series. The CO2 Foundation supports nonprofit organizations and individuals who seek to disrupt the causes and consequences of a rapidly changing climate. I encourage you all to visit their website and learn more about the great work that they are doing. For this session, we are going to be using GoToWebinar, so I wanted to take a moment to orient you with the software. Um, we're going to have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of this session, so feel free to send in questions for our presenters throughout the session. Um, on the side here, you'll see you have a questions tab where you can send in your questions. In addition, at the bottom of your screen, you'll have four arrows pointing inward. This will allow you to um, go into full screen mode. Your screen might also look something like this, but it has the same functionality in this control panel. So to go full screen, you can click on this button here, and then you have your questions tab as well. I also wanted to note that this is just one session of a four part series that has taken place throughout April and May. Unfortunately, this is our last session. However, recordings of the first three sessions um, are available online at our website, which is nationaladaptationforum.org. And a recording of this session will also be posted online, hopefully before the end of the week. And with that, um, I would like to introduce today's speakers. So our first speaker is Grace Ka Kaplowitz. Um, Grace is a planner with The Good Company, a division of parametrics. Grace's work is centered on community well-being, adaptation, and environmental stewardship. She has experience in project management, grant applications, as well as community outreach and engagement. Grace has a degree in planning, public policy, and management. Um, our second speaker today is Dr. Ida Sammy, who is the Director of Research and Impact at Community Lattice. Ida is an interdisciplinary researcher with expertise in environmental planning and design, architectural engineering, and extreme heat mitigation. At Community Lattice, Ida leads a team of innovative thinkers to challenge pressing and emerging problems to develop solutions at the intersection of environmental justice, urban planning and climate resilience strategy, public health and social equity. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Grace for our first presentation of the day. Thank you so much, Carrie. I'm really grateful to be here and be part of this wonderful webinar. Thank you to Eco Adapt and the National Adaptation Forum. It's great to be here. Let me just take a moment to get my screen set up here. All right. Is that looking good to everybody, Carrie? Yes, that is great. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again. As Carrie mentioned, my name is Grace Kaplowitz with Good Company, a division of Parametrics, and I'm really grateful to be here today. Before I begin, I do want to just start with the disclaimer that this presentation is building off of our team's collective body of work and a lot of work completed by folks um, beyond myself and our team. And I do not claim to be an expert in everything that we do, but I'll do my best to do justice to our work and share some of the lessons learned and takeaways and some of the stories that we're hearing in Oregon communities. It's hot in the Pacific Northwest this week, and I hope everyone is staying cool and has the resources that they need. So with that, I will kick it off with kind of an overview of what is normal in Oregon anyways. You know, we know that here in Oregon, we haven't historically had a hot climate. It's a historically moderate and temperate climate, as you can see in this map here. Historically, we've seen less than 10 days over 90 degrees in most of the state. This map shows between 1971 and 2000. And so on average, it's not 
a very hot climate. And when we talk about heat and extreme heat in the Oregon context, it's really comparing the heat we're seeing today and into the future with the heat that we've had in the past. If we compare Oregon's climate to some of the hotter parts of the US or around the world, it doesn't seem that extreme, but compared to what we're used to here and our baseline, there have been really serious impacts and will continue to be those today. And that's really because our infrastructure, economic systems and social systems haven't been designed for heat. They've been designed to keep people cool and or keep people warm in the winter and safe from winter storms, not cool in the summer. So I wanted to start with that overview of where we are and really center this presentation on Oregon and the context here because everything that I share is kind of at that scale and comparing to our baseline and what's normal here. Next up, I wanna talk a little bit about the 2021 heat dome event that we had in the summer of 2021. And this um, graphic shows what the temperatures were at the Portland airport during that year. The heat dome was focused on the week of June 27th where we had temperatures into the hundreds. And really what I want to emphasize here is just as we're seeing other kind of non-dramatic climate events in different areas, like in Texas having a winter storm that for a northern climate would be considered no big deal. For us, this heat dome was maybe a no big deal heat event for warmer parts of the world, but in our context, it had really severe impacts. And I'll show that on the next slide here. This is from Multnomah County, Oregon, where Portland is located. And this during this heat dome event, we had 72 deaths. And I wanna emphasize that while that number is smaller than in other parts of the country in the world, the normal number of heat deaths in Oregon is zero. So 72 deaths for us is a very big increase from that baseline of zero. And then this graphic is also looking at the types of cooling that people had access to and demonstrating that only 14% of people that perished in that heat event had access to AC. So this is kind of, again, setting the stage for what's normal in Oregon, the 2021 heat dome, and what has happened as a result of that. So here we're looking at some of the state of Oregon's responses to try and protect people from extreme heat in the state. And this is kind of a wordy slide. I'm not going to get into all of the details, but I want to highlight that the state of Oregon and many local groups are taking a multifaceted look at how we can prevent um, people from experiencing the negative health and safety impacts from heat. So one important piece of legislation was making it so that landlords can no longer prohibit or restrict tenants from installing or using portable cooling devices. But I do wanna add the caveat that what we're hearing from community partners on the ground is that while this is a great step in the right direction, it's still not getting us 100% to meeting the needs because there's still a lot of um, details around not damaging property and blocking egress windows and access points. So it's still restricting the types of cooling people are able to use in their homes. Um, it also requires cooling in new dwelling units, which is very important, but does not get at the existing building stock where we're really seeing most of the vulnerability. And I'll get more into that as we go through today's presentation. And then there's some updates around warming centers to include cooling and air filtration and programs to implement and distribute air conditioners, air filters, ductless heat pumps, and other types of cooling equipment for folks around the state. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about ductless heat pumps today and how they're a great solution for um, addressing extreme heat as well as cold and smoke here in the state of Oregon, but we'll get into that in, in the next couple of slides. So next up, we're gonna look at what's on the horizon for heat in Oregon and how the temperatures are projected to increase. And I wanna ground that in a quick overview of our current climate change scenarios. So the next couple of slides I'm gonna show are looking at temperature predictions. And we're looking at both kind of what is the best case scenario? And this is based on lower emissions. If we are able to do the best we can to reduce and stop emitting and stop climate, the worst impacts from climate change, then that's the lower emissions best case scenario or more optimistic scenario. 
And we also have the higher emission scenario, and that's if business continues as usual and we do not act as quickly, then that's where we're going to see the, the temperatures increasing even more drastically. And so I think really the emphasis I wanna leave you all with here is that the importance of both adapting to heat as it's coming regardless of what we do here, but also how quickly we need to act on trying to reduce the impacts as much as possible. And this slide is looking for um, data from northern North Portland, Oregon, and looking at the future average temperatures. So this graph specifically shows how average summer and winter temperatures will increase over the next 80 years, um, starting, if I can dry your eyes, to 2020, kind of where we are now. And you can see that um, but all of these lines are going up. The dotted line is that kind of optimistic best case scenario line, and the bold line is the more pessimistic um, worst case scenario, or if we don't act quickly and ch change the trajectory for climate change. And I do wanna add the caveat that we are aware that we're likely gonna fall somewhere in between those two lines. We're not expecting to be on either end, but we need to be able to see the full picture of what's possible in our modeling. And even with the lower emissions best case scenario, so we're going to see average summer temperatures going from around um, 79 degrees up a, a lot higher um, to 85 or 90 throughout the century, and as well as the winter temperatures. The next couple of slides are going to show this in maps. And so this, uh, this first slide is looking at the optimistic or lower emission scenario. And this is days over 90 degrees. Again, thinking back to that first map that I shared. On the left, it's through 2039, 2050. And on the right, it's through 2100. So you can see here that we're gonna see an increase even in the best case scenario to where we start seeing you know, 30 or more days over 90 in all of the populated areas of the state in the next 80 years. And then the next slides are gonna show the more extreme pessimistic or higher emissions scenario. And this is where it starts to look a lot more dramatic, where almost the entire state is gonna see 60 plus days over 90 by 2100. And I think these maps really get at why we need to act now on climate change, as well as doing our best to adapt to make our communities safer. But again, thinking about these maps and these temperatures, what's the big deal? It still doesn't look that hot compared to a lot of the rest of the world. And while much of the rest of the global population already lives in hotter climates where this is already normal, they plan and build accordingly and they're more adapted for the hotter temperatures. But in Oregon, like I said previously, our infrastructure, economic systems, and social systems are not adapted for this type of heat. And I think one of the big takeaways here is that we're all going to need cooling equipment and air conditioning. But the good news is that we can learn from our neighbors and communities in hard, hotter climates and other parts of the world. Next up, I'm going to talk a little bit about smoke and why I didn't want to present here about extreme heat without touching on smoke as well. This photo is one I took uh, from this last summer in Oak Ridge, Oregon, a small rural community during the 2022 Cedar Creek fire when the air quality was in the hazardous range. You know, there were many days above three and four hundred AQI. And we want to talk about smoke here because smoke and heat are often going to show up together. They happen in the same time frame in the summer and fall when we're experiencing heat, drought, and increased wildfires. And heat is often more acute, at least in Oregon. We often have maybe one or two or three consecutive days of extreme heat, while smoke is increasingly becoming prolonged and chronic. So while there are similar responses and, and adaptions that we can do around cooling and cleaner air spaces and portable equipment, there's kind of some compounding health and safety concerns from exposure to both. And both of these show up where people are guaranteed to be spending their time at work and at home. And that's really gonna get at a lot of what I'm talking about today around housing. This slide is looking again at the Oak Ridge, Oregon community at wildfire smoke trends from 1997 through 2022. And it really shows how smoke is increasing. As I said, the Cedar Creek fire, we had 37 consecutive days of unhealthy air quality between unhealthy for sensitive groups to hazardous. And I really wanna highlight how smoke in particular is showing up as an equity and environmental justice concern in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest, because it really is having disproportionate impact 
impacts on our rural communities uh, due to their proximity to forests. And while smoke is affecting our urban areas and the higher population centers, the rural areas are getting a lot less attention and tend not to get as noticed. And I'll show next some maps again from the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, looking at the average number of unsafe or above air quality days between 2003 and 2022. So this is an AQI of 100 or above. And you can see from 2003 to 2012, we're still seeing you know, less than or equal to three days per year in most parts of the state. And in the last 10 years, there's a, a big increase. And while this legend only goes up to 12.7, as I showed in the previous slide, the Oak Ridge community here experienced 37 days last summer alone. And you know, while we're thinking about this from the statewide perspective, last summer we heard about the kind of one or two or three days where there was unhealthy air quality in Portland and Seattle. And while it's an important issue in the metro areas, like I said, we're not hearing as much for the rural communities and there wasn't news coverage locally or nationally about this community that couldn't breathe safely for over a month in the summer. So I think it's really important to consider that and the kind of rural community issue that we're seeing with smoke and heat together. Next up, we're going to share some examples of lessons learned and takeaways and stories we're hearing in our work. And um, on the slide, it's going to it shows some of the projects that we're going to be talking about, as well as this Venn diagram looking at some of the lenses that we look through when we think about climate and adaptation. So we think about the effects to the infrastructure, the built and natural environment, and how we can adapt those spaces, as well as economic systems and social systems and health. When we're thinking about heat and infrastructure, you know, we're talking about parks and shade structures and the, the environment that we can build around us. In our economic systems, we're thinking about workplace health and safety and policies to keep people cool at work and maybe changing work schedules to get them to, you know, take a siesta or be safe during the hottest parts of the day. But when we're looking at social systems and health, this is really where all roads are leading back to housing and why I'm going to focus on that today, because housing is where people are outside of workplaces. And while workplaces have policies and mandates to protect people, there are no rules, mandates or policies to protect people at home. And I think our challenge here is how we can make the places that people are guaranteed to be at home and at work safer for everybody. So talking a little bit about our community climate action planning work, really the, the heart of this work is helping communities prepare for the baseline to change and going beyond planning for emergencies and emergency response. So this graphic is from our City of Eugene Climate Action Plan. And while the numbers and the information here are slightly different from how things are gonna change in Portland due to the microclimates across Oregon, it's really about working with communities to see how the baseline is going to change and what we can do about it to keep people healthy and safe and reduce emissions along the way. Through our climate action plans, we work directly with a lot of communities across Oregon and the Northwest and with community partners. And I want to share a little bit about what we're hearing related specifically to access to cooling shelters and cleaner air spaces and some of the challenges or barriers folks have faced in terms of accessing those resources when there is extreme heat. So what we're hearing is that people are uncomfortable or feel unsafe walking in the heat or waiting at a bus stop in order to get to a shelter. People have been concerned about COVID-19 and health concerns being in public spaces. And of course, the compounding issues surrounding homelessness and our um, unhoused populations and people feeling uncomfortable or unsafe being in shelters that are being used by people who are unhoused where they don't have any other options. So again, while cooling shelters are an, a very important immediate next step and something to do in an acute moment of heat, we really want to work towards getting permanent cooling access in everybody's homes and the places where they're spending the most time. Next, I'm going to share a little bit about a project we're working on in Oak Ridge, Oregon, which is targeted airshed grants funded by the EPA. And this is a project that's focused on smoke and reducing fine particulate matter PM 2.5, specifically from winter wood smoke and wood stoves. So historically, the community has heated their homes using wood. And there is unreliable access to electricity with frequent power outages in the winter. And so this has been a really interesting project where the focus has been 
smoke, but we've been able to see all of these different intersections with heat and cold and health and safety in people's houses. And a lot of the work we're doing here is removing old uncertified wood stoves and replacing them with highly efficient electric heat, such as ductless heat pumps, as well as weatherizing people's homes. And that combination of interventions is really allowing us to get at you know, air quality, heat and heating needs, cooling and cooling needs, as well as overall efficiency and reducing emissions and helping people stay health and safety in their homes. These interventions are allowing people to be more permanently safer, more comfortable and have more efficient homes. And the same interventions here with ductless heat pumps and weatherization can be used to address climate, heat, air quality concerns. And in this rural community where you know, we have a highly low income population, we're really getting at some of the health equity and environmental justice outcomes by doing these interventions that are looking at all these compounding issues. Another big takeaway from this program has been distributing air purifiers, um, HEPA, pur HEPA filter purifiers directly to people and their homes. The program initially had 500 purifiers to distribute. And then during the Cedar Creek fire in partnership with Oregon Health Authority, we were able to work with community partners and get out an additional thousand purifiers. So we've distributed 1500 purifiers into the community. And this has really helped change the narrative around smoke and air quality and wildfire and what people can do to adapt and try and protect themselves and i think there's a big lesson to be taken away from that in terms of you know we don't want to wait until there's a really extreme event to try and help get people the help that they need but can we use these events and the changing weather and circumstances to help people understand how to protect themselves and change their behaviors around heat and smoke Next up, I'm gonna share an example from work we've done with the city of Eugene around looking at what it would take to decarbonize the building stock for residential, commercial, and industrial buildings. And really here, I wanna highlight for the residential buildings and housing types, the particular vulnerability that we're seeing with mobile and manufactured homes. So when we're looking and talking about cooling facilities and what cooling is needed, as well as air filters. We're talking about energy consumption. And this graph really shows that mobile and manufactured homes are consuming the most energy per, per square foot. They're often the least well sealed and the building codes are, are were the least adequate, particularly for older mobile and manufactured homes. And this is really highlighting, you know, often it's lower income folks in rural communities living in these housing types. And they have the greatest energy burden and are the greatest risk for extreme temperatures and smoke. So that's one of the takeaways we've seen looking at housing is kind of the different vulnerabilities across housing types and across urban and urban and rural environments. And finally, I'm going to share some examples that we're learning while we're conducting the Oregon Cooling Needs Study on behalf of the Oregon Department of Energy. So this project is looking statewide, uh, specifically at housing types that the state has seen as most vulnerable to to heat and the need for cooling. So that's publicly supported multifamily housing, manufactured and mobile home dwelling parks and recreational vehicles being used as housing. And we're looking to understand, you know, what, where are these housing types located? What is the prevalence? Whether or not they have cooling equipment, but really going beyond that to understand the social conditions and behaviors around heat and how people seek relief. So we're working in partnership with a network of community-based organizations to conduct outreach and distribute a survey that's asking folks about whether or not they have cooling, but also whether or not it works and what barriers they might be facing to using that cooling equipment or to maintaining it, whether it's the cost of bills or the cost of maintenance, whether it's that the technology is confusing or you know there's language barriers or other types of barriers that folks might be facing to meet their needs. And then what are they currently doing to try and stay stay cool when they don't have adequate cooling in their home? Is it going to a friend's house and getting in their kiddie pool? Are they using these cooling shelters? And why are people or why aren't people able to access some of the resources that we already have available like energy utility assistance programs? And we're really trying to understand the cooling needs both from the technical standpoint as well as the cultural behavioral standpoint of how people are thinking about heat and what education is needed so that people can adapt and respond and keep themselves safe. 
I know this has been a lot and kind of sharing examples from many different project areas, but I'm going to sum it all up with some key takeaways that I want you all to think about. So I think, for, like I said in the beginning, we can and need to learn from communities in warmer climates. We're not the only ones experiencing heat, and the heat in Oregon doesn't seem that extreme compared to other areas, but compared to what we're used to and our baseline, it is increasingly becoming more extreme. While emergency responses such as portable air conditioners and cooling shelters are important and so essential in these acute moments of need, we're ultimately aiming for every home to have permanent cooling. And on that note, I really wanna emphasize the usefulness of ductless heat pumps that are able to meet the needs for cooling as well as heating and are working towards our electrification or decarbonization goals. And they're also not pulling in air from the outside. So when it's smoky out, they can help along those lines as well. And paired with weatherizing people's homes, we can really look at addressing the home envelope and helping people be more safe and comfortable in their homes. Of course, we also are, are grateful for and need to continue with the voluntary incentive programs like the ones that the state of Oregon is rolling out right now around heat pumps and free air purifiers. And then of course, we can consider code revisions and what we can do from a planning perspective to change the infrastructure and housing um, on these lines, building code updates are probably necessary and happening, but we also want to look at rental codes because rental codes could force retrofits, which is where we're seeing the most vulnerabilities in our current housing stock. Regarding needing to know more than the weather forecast, this is really going back to what I'm sharing about the different housing types and the different contexts for communities that we're working in, living in. And so we really wanna know about, you know, the age types and norms of the housing stock, whether or not they have adequate electricity for some of these upgrades that are needed, as well as the behaviors and cultural norms around heat and cooling and what people are doing or not doing or aware of in terms of their heat. You know, we heard during the heat, Dome, that some of the people that were most at risk for heat didn't know that they were at risk for heat and didn't realize that their home was too hot or unsafe. And so there's something to be said for the behavior around temperature and the culture that we have here in the historically temperate Northwest and what needs to be done to kind of learn from our neighbors in warmer climates. For housing, there are different responses needed for urban and rural environments. As I mentioned previously, in rural environments, the highest vulnerability we're seeing is in the manufactured and mobile homes, and there's a lot of corresponding health and safety issues with mold and energy burden and the materials that some of these older homes are built with. Whereas in urban areas, we're really looking at multifamily and density, and we're looking at some of these kind of um, conflicting priorities around water tension and water conservation, the need for green space and shaded areas while also needing to conserve water, large buildings trapping heat, and that lower income multifamily housing might not actually have adequate facilities on site to have a shared cooling space. So what are the needs for that and how better can we understand how to meet the, the needs for people as close to their own homes as possible? And for air filtration, what we've found and experienced so far is really that portable air filters that people can take home and put in their own homes and set up a cleaner air space in their home is the current best option, particularly for prolonged smoke exposure of 30 plus days like we saw in Oak Ridge last summer. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this presentation. Thank you all for your time. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A after the next presentation. Thank you so much, Grace. That was um, an amazing presentation and I look forward to some Q&A. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Ida for her presentation. Oh, we're hey. not hearing you. There you go. Can you see my screen? Um, yep, we can see it. Awesome. Hi, everyone. And Welcome, uh, my name is Aida Sami, and I am a Director of Research and Impact at Community Lotus. I hold a PhD in Environmental Science and background in Architectural Engineering, Urban Planning, and today I am going to present awesome stuff about extreme heat and urban resiliency, trying to address how we can use brownfield redevelopment to decrease the extreme heat. A little bit about our company, Community Lattice is a woman-owned social enterprise 
funded an mission to drive change, land revitalization policies and practices to respond to the real time and real world needs of disadvantaged communities. We are a multidisciplinary team of environmental experts, planner, data scientists, community organize, organizer, and we are working at the nexus of digital innovation, community development, environmental health, and we are trying to see how this can impact our community and how we can bring more climate justice. As part of our work, we are, try, we are using data science for social and environmental impacts. Uh, we are using community engagement to increase the uh, capacity and build capacity within the community. And uh, we are doing the brownfield redevelopment and environmental justice consulting. So let's jump into the extreme heat stuff. As you can see here uh, in this website, I try to share the live website with you. And um, I'm not sure if right now it's working or not, but there is a source here. I will share this slides after my presentation with you. And uh, we know that extreme heat is leading um, weather-related hazards, and it's killing a lot of people comparing to other weather hazards. And in 2070, based on what they predicted, in only 51 counties in the United States, the heat index will help blow 100 Fahrenheit almost all around the year. Watch, what does this mean? It means that we will have almost every day it's hot and you will sweat every day, especially if you are low income and you don't have an AC or privilege of using personal car. So when we are talking about extreme heat, uh, there is an unequal impact. As I mentioned in my previous sentence, uh, heat is not impacting everyone in the same way. If you are rich, you have a personal car, you have an AC, you will probably not feel the heat in the same way that a person who is living in disadvantaged community uh, without AC or they are depending on public transportation to go to their work, so they need to wait and use public transportation. Based on my PhD research, waiting more than like two or three minutes in a degree above 90 uh, Fahrenheit can increase your risk to get any kind of heat-related illnesses. So why we are talking about brownfield? We are talking about brownfields because brownfields can bring uh, opportunity to urban areas to address their challenges. If we can find a solution to use our climate resilience, climate mitigation, uh, and like heat mitigation strategies to re redevelop the brownfields, we can address the challenges uh, within the cities for public infrastructure and resource management. We want to understand the impact of extreme heat. Extreme heat cause more deaths annually than any other weather related hazards, as I mentioned in my first intro. A number of the heat related deaths during 2018 until 2020 is uh, 3066 and this data is coming uh, from the statics that we have available i'm sure like with extreme heat event most of the people who are right now attended to this webinar probably they remember that last year we had the worst days and like in places like seattle and vancouver we had a lot of heat related deaths and a team of researchers at the National Bureau of Economic Research has found evidence suggesting that if we don't address greenhouse gas em emissions and we don't decrease the greenhouse gas emission, um, in the future we will experience more heat waves and more extreme heat events, which is like causing to kill millions of people across the globe. Besides like heat mortality, we have heat morbidity. What is heat morbidity? E extreme heat uh, can cause really, really serious health issues. And uh, one of these health issues is 
heat exhaustion. Another is like heat stroke. These are two serious uh, heat related illnesses that can cause even to the death. Uh, when you are getting any of these heat related illnesses, you might uh, feel over sweating, your body feels more hot and you will get headaches. There are like a valid data showing that a lot of people are visiting emergency rooms during the summer, especially because the place that I am living, I live in, in Arizona. So there are a lot of people during the summer, especially in uh, Maricopa County that visited the emergency room due to getting like heat stroke. And they don't know like general public, they can't recognize the heat stroke. So they are like telling that they are experiencing headache, nausea, or like they don't feel good after like using public transportation or going to the hike uh, in the middle of the day when it's like really hot. So these illnesses can affect some people more than others. If you have any kind of pre-existing condition, health issues like respiratory disaster or like you have a heart issues, it can affect you more than others. Also, the disadvantaged communities, communities of color, outdoor workers, pregnant women, children, these are part of the population who are more vulnerable to extreme heat um, illnesses. We need to address the heat inequities. And we already discussed about this kind of, at the beginning, heat is not affecting everyone in the same way. Disadvantaged communities experience higher vulnerability to extreme heat, and uh, they feel extreme heat in different way because factors such as socioeconomic status, limited healthcare uh, access, and like poor infrastructure, poor living condition, and don't have access to personal vehicles most of the time, uh, can cause uh, to feel extreme heat more in disadvantaged communities. And when we are talking about disadvantaged communities, the data from EPA is showing that brownfields uh, most of the brownfields are like located near to the disadvantaged communities. And since they are not developed, uh, they are creating more uh, health issues. And especially like one of the issues with heat and brownfield, both of them is cardiovascular issues. And people who are living even near the brownfields, they experience this more than others. So let's see. Okay. <laughs> and here we want to talk about brown field and urban heat island. Um, what is urban heat island? Urban heat island is happening mostly in cities because cities, due to their infrastructure and darker color, um, they are observing more heat during the day and releasing it during the night, which is causing to have a higher temperature. Um, so, uh, comparing to the surrounding rural areas. So when we are talking about brownfield, I have a study and there are a lot of other researchers that's showing the brownfield significantly contribute to the formation of urban heat islands and it can increase the urban heat islands effect. You might be curious how this can happen. Most of the brownfields, uh, if they are like previously used and right now it's vacant, uh, they have a darker surface, they don't have enough trees, they don't have enough shading, so all of these poor infrastructure causing to have more heat absorption are releasing during the night, so it's increasing the urban heat island effect. So considering heat in brownfield redevelopment is really important for creating more resilience and livable communities. When we are talking about urban resiliency and brownfield, we want to explore how cities can make a significant impact through their role in brownfield redevelopment and address the challenges of extreme heat. Cities face uh, different challenges when it comes to brownfield and extreme heat. Brownfields uh, underutilized or contaminated lands and they are like posing 
risks to public health, uh, to public infrastructure, and they are continuing to create some kind of in environmental hazards and health issues. So extreme heat uh, can increase these challenges. So most of the time, brownfields often acting as a heat observing areas, as I mentioned, due to lack of the enough shading or trees or poor infrastructure, darker surfaces, and using the heat mitigation strategies to mitigate the heat and redevelop the brown fields can help us to uh, bring more urban resiliency to our urban areas. Moving forward, I would like to discuss some of the case studies and works we did in community letters. Oops. <laughs> we did in community letters, and um, one of the works and projects that we worked, uh, we were part of the uh, redeveloping parks and turning brownfields to the parks. We had a collaboration with Buffalo Bio Park, which is a nonprofit developer. And we, as a community lettuce, we did the brownfield inventory for them, and we are still continuing uh, to do the collaboration with the city of Houston to advance the development of uh, Buffalo Bio Park and uh, trying to um, advocate for more social justice, especially regarding the extreme heat. So Buffalo Bio Park project is a project that we were part of the project and the main purpose of this project is uh, to revitalize the Buffalo Bio area and turn it to the dynamic and vibrant community and event space. Main focus is the community here. So Buffalo Bio is trying to create a space which is safe and which is comfortable to bring community together and provide a space that all demographic can attend and use the space. So in order to creating this kind of space, uh, we suggested to use uh, heat mitigation strategies in the redevelopment. So in Buffalo Bio project, they consider heat mitigation strategies to ensure that the area is comfortable, safe, it provides um, more shades and cooling, uh, especially during the hot season in the Houston, Texas, for people to have a place to come and have a social interaction. Also, climate resilience design strategies uh, are considered uh, in uh, this redevelopment, and they are trying to use design elements um, to increase um, their ability to adapt to the extreme heat and other uh, hazards. This is another project that we had an opportunity to collaborate with one architect, our one architecture firm, and uh, the main goal is enhancing the commercial building uh, resilience to extreme weather, including the flooding, high winds, power outrage, drought, and cold. So as you can see here in the picture, uh, in the left side, uh, we have a heat vulnerability index map. And the area that we worked, if you can see, sometimes like the heating index is passing 106, which is really dangerous for your health. So in order to manage the heat, we suggested to use green roofs, facades, and shading methods to reduce the heat gain and increase the cooling. Uh, there were other hazards that we tried to address, like flood, energy security, drought, um, and how we can bring more value to this neighborhood. All of this stuff, we try to use uh, urban resilience metric to address all of these mitigation uh, strategies. And in all of these steps, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, community is really important for us as a community lattice, and we are focusing to bring more welfare, welfare and social justice. So we consider community benefits in all of the projects that we are attending. Uh, to protect property owners, tents, and um, whole neighborhood. This is 
a really fun project. I know most of the people are curious about AI, and if you saw my <laughs> LinkedIn page, I am using different, like, uh, I am like trying to use different AIs to figure out how we can use AI in a best way uh, in urban planning and environmental science. So this is a project that we are working currently with Land Bank. Land Bank asked us to provide a conceptual reuse planning for them uh, to develop a brownfield. So the main point was for the project, uh, they asked us to provide a project considering the resilience metric. And uh, we used uh, AI. The picture that you are seeing here, I created uh, with AI and uh, I asked AI to add green roofs to show, showcase the uh, missing middle houses. And if we can add green roofs, what we can have as a result. So as we mentioned, like extreme heat is one of the main issues in Houston, Texas, and uh, even like the website that I showed you about like predicting extreme heat days, they are mentioning that one of the states that's more affecting uh, by the extreme heat is Texas. And most of the people who are dying because of the extreme heat are Hispanic people. So based on the community in the neighborhood that we are working with Land Bank, we suggested to have extreme heat mitigation strategies incorporate with the redevelopment. So Green roofs is one of the ways that you can bring climate adaptation and it can help you to mitigate the effects of climate change and uh, it can decrease the extreme heat, it can provide a place for social interaction, it can affect your mental health, it can give a better view and it can even decrease the energy usage inside your building. So uh, we try to move from traditional economic model to inco incorporate the climate adaptation benefits uh, into the final design. So this is an ongoing project and stay tuned. <laughs> check us, uh, check our website so you will see awesome results with AI, data science and whole climate adaptation and mitigation strategies. So what are the common heat mitigation strategies? One of them we used for the land bank was like green roofs, but there are other heat mitigation strategies that you can use if you are redeveloping the brownfield. Uh, one of them is green infrastructure and urban greening. You can integrate parks, green spaces, and urban uh, forests to provide more shade and evaporation cooling and manage stormwater runoffs. Uh, another is like cool roofs and reflective surface. Um, uh, you can use reflective surface, like lighter color surface or cool roofs, different materials. Uh, these materials are observing less heat, so it can help you to have a cooler space. And you can use passive cooling and natural ventilation. Most of the time, architects, uh, if they are doing the planning, like larger scale, like neighborhood, design or even like smaller scale for the like building, they can use the climate sensitive design and they can consider all of the climate elements based on the location uh, and like some stuff like orientation of the building, um, how to use more ventilation like natural ventilation and some other stuff to bring more thermal comfort to the uh, inside and outside of the property. Another thing is that based on the location that you live, if you have a water availability, I know like we need to consider future climate change and we need to consider that we might have more droughts. So uh, we can even like use the rainwater harvesting system to use water and feature like cooling water features and having a water foundation or something that can help you uh, to mitigate the heat in your uh, redevelopment. And 
speaking of the redevelopment and heat mitigation strategies, all of these steps uh, steps uh, can help you to bring more uh, benefits to the community because most of the heat related deaths are happening for example in Arizona during the like early August or like sometimes in like mid July because most of the cooling center like homeless people they don't have access to the cooling center so if you try to redevelop the brownfield in a way that you can create some kind of property that's open to the public and with uh, like more cooling uh, strategies you can provide the cooling centers to the people who are in need especially during the summer season why it's really important to make an attention for the extreme heat uh, in the context of urban planning and brownfield redevelopment because um, adapting to the climate change and uh, what we talked, it can increase the um, resiliency to the extreme heat and it can create more sustainable and livable cities for our future generation. We are responsible. So, and it can uh, promote equitable access to the heat mitigation resources and strategies. There are always some risks. And today I want to talk about the risk. If uh, if you want to redevelop a land, especially if it's a brownfield and you are ignoring the extreme heat mitigation strategies in your property, this can increase the heat related health risk for future occupants and it can create a poor thermal comfort for indoor and outdoor. It, it doesn't matter if you don't feel comfortable like indoor you will not feel comfortable outdoor because you didn't consider uh, extreme heat to have appropriate like cooling effects inside and outside it can increase the heat related illnesses and it can increase even the deaths uh, related to the heat and it has a negative impact on energy consumption and costs and it can increase the utility rate for people who are living in that property because the more they need to use the air conditioner the more they will pay for the utility and consider that using more air conditioner and like using more uh, cooling and any kind of stuff uh, that we are using if we don't consider the uh, heat mitigation strategies inside and outside of the building we are creating more um, carbon emission so we are not helping to decrease the carbon emission we will experience more extreme heat with the acts that we are taking today so we need to act to decrease the extreme heat today and uh, also all of this stuff can if you don't consider it you can affect the resiliency for whole city and we can't have a resilient city without considering the um, extreme heat mitigation in our developments uh, there are some future implications of the extreme heat and brownfield. Uh, the broader implications of the extreme heat and uh, brownfield redevelopment is environmental justice and equitable heat mitigation strategies. In long term, uh, this can uh, impact a community health and well-being. Even like today, we are experiencing uh, and we are getting like some feedback from community uh, regarding the like tree planting community are happy because they have more shade and it can integrate the climate resilience to the urban planning so there are some i'm a director of research and there are some research that i'm currently doing with my team in the community lettuce and uh, there are some future research that I want to really focus on them. Uh, as a team, we are assessing the effectiveness of heat mitigation strategies in brownfield redevelopment. And uh, how we are assessing this, uh, we are using the qualitative and quantitative uh, research method uh, to assess, like we have survey interviews and we have some kind of other uh, macroclimatic uh, measurements uh, to 
calculate the thermal comfort for uh, the redevelopment that we are doing. And uh, there are other stuff like exploring innovation technologies for heat reduction in urban environment. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm a huge fan of AI and new technology. And um, our company is kind of unique because you are, you, we are using the data science to address problems in the intersection of social justice, urban planning, brownfield, and everything. So AI is a huge thing, and I believe that in the near future, we will have more opportunity to use AI to help us to expedite the whole process for creating the extreme heat mitigation uh, strategies, and especially like visualization. And uh, we are examining the social, economic, and health disparities associated to the heat and brownfield. We are focusing on like community engagement. We have a great uh, community engagement director. Uh, she's involved with community, and we have a community uh, engagement assessment that we are using after any kind of development that we are doing or like collaborating with any company. So I have a brief slide of a conclusion to wrap up the presentation. Uh, as we talked, extreme heat is leading cause of weather-related deaths in the United States and disadvantaged communities uh, and brownfield programs and redevelopment projects offer actionable opportunities to address heat-related challenges and achieve urban resilience. Integrating heat mitigation strategies in brownfield planning is really important to mitigate risk to human health and uh, protect public infrastructure and manage water and energy consumption. Brownfields contribute to the urban heat island effects and it can increase the extreme heat and affect the community. Uh, the integration of heat mitigation strategies such as green infrastructure, cool roofs, cool surfaces uh, can have really huge benefits, including improving public health, energy usage, um, climate resiliency, and increasing even the like benefits for our communities. It's really critical to prior, uh, prioritize equity and environmental justice and community engagement in brownfield redevelopment in any kind of redevelopments because if you are doing the redevelopment for a city, city is a place that community are living. So you need to consider the community and have that community engagement, ask them what they need uh, in order to do any kind of redevelopment, especially if you are an urban planner or scientist, you need to talk in a way that they can understand and this can help us to mitigate all kinds of hazards and increase the resiliency, including the um, extreme heat resilience. Uh, our future research will focus on addressing the effectiveness of heat mitigation strategies, and we will explore more innovative uh, technologies uh, to understand the socioeconomic and health these parties associated with the heat and brownfield. As I mentioned, there are some ongoing projects that we need to see the results and start to do the assessment for those. And we will have more attention to the extreme heat because my expertise is in extreme heat. And um, as part of the company, we want to focus more on climate adaptation and extreme heat aspects. Uh, to adapt to the climate change, to create more sustainable communities and promote equitable access to heat mitigation resources to everyone. Thanks for joining and listening to me. And if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to me by email. And thank you. Thank you so much, Ida. That was an excellent presentation. Um, Okay, with that, I will invite Grace to join us again on screen. And I think we can go ahead and get started with our Q&A. Um, I will invite any of our attendees, if you have questions for our presenters, feel free to put them 
in that questions tab, um, we have a few that have come up during the presentations. Um, the first one I am going to pass over to you, Grace. Um, someone asked, have there been any recent studies in Oregon looking at the relationship between heat related illnesses, whether that's you know heat stroke, ER visits, and high temperature days? And then they followed up and said, are there any models to predict future health outcomes alongside future weather forecasting? Awesome, thank you, Carrie. And those are great questions. I'll share what I know and I'm happy to follow up with folks uh, directly as well to get into this a little bit deeper. But I think I'll say that there is, Multnomah County has been doing a lot of work specifically around this since the 2021 heat dome. And their report after the event does include some analysis that they were able to get Oregon essence data and data from the Oregon Health Authority. And so they do specifically tie heat related illness visits to emergency departments and urgent care. Um, correlated with the temperature. So there's the beginnings of that work just for Multnomah County. I haven't seen anything from a statewide perspective or those future modeling, but I, I'm not sure it's possible that there are studies and resources happening that I'm not aware of. Um, but I think we're just kind of at that tipping point in Oregon of starting to get into some of this a little bit deeper. And I would expect to see a lot more resources coming soon. I'll also say quickly, one thing that I didn't share during my presentation was that during that heat dome event, when we had 72 deaths in Multnomah County, we also had um, a doubling of deaths from all causes during that week. So deaths from all causes doubled. And I think there's a lot more to learn there about heat and how heat is impacting people beyond mortality and specific heat related deaths as Ida mentioned in her presentation as well. Great, thank you so much. So I'm interested to know from both of you, kind of what are the largest barriers at the moment um, when it comes to adapting to extreme heat? Um, and how are both of you thinking about kind of overcoming these barriers? Um, Ida, I'll let you start and then Grace, you can go. Uh, actually, as I mentioned, my whole PhD is focused on the extreme heat and I worked on the extreme heat resilience. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with city of Tucson and the product of my research is used in the climate action of the Tucson. So it's the thing that we have a gap of knowledge, especially between like policy and decision makers. So we need to like inform them in a way that they can understand so we can help them to make better decisions for our cities. And regarding the like general public, because I had like surveys and I asked public transit users here in Tucson to fill the survey. As I mentioned, even here, and like I had like a couple lit reviews, people, they don't know about the symptoms of the extreme heat and heat exhaustion, how serious this could be and how this can affect even their pets if they are living in like hot region and it, it's really serious most of the people they mentioned that they experienced like headache while they were using the public transportation but they didn't stop the use because they don't have any other choice so i feel like there is a gap of knowledge and we need to like connect the dots be between different disciplines from like data science, like climate modeling and public health planning. And one more thing is like really important is that because I'm coming from like interdisciplinary background and my PhD even is like interdisciplinary. I would like to ask everyone who is here and who is scientist and like uh, I saw that Grace was talking about for like climate modeling and stuff. Most of the time when we are like talking with community, no one can understand what's happening beside those graphs and what we mean by telling we will have more extreme heat weather. It's better if we can change the language and tell them, for example, you will experience more days that you have a headache, you can go out to buy grocery or you can go out to the walk if we continue to do the same activities that we are doing right now. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll build a little bit off of what Ida shared. I think along these lines of perception and language and behavior change, it really brings me back to our experience in the Oak Ridge community around smoke more specifically and how how effective kind of the messaging and the narrative shift were when people were really forced to live in this extreme smoke environment for a prolonged period of time. And kind of that tension between not wanting to have to have people experience these extreme events firsthand and not be prepared for it in order to really understand what it's gonna feel like. But there is some reality to that. So I think using experiences that people can relate to and already understand and thinking about, you know, our own lived experiences. Like for me, I grew up here in the Western part of Oregon and I don't remember it ever being over 90 degrees in May and we just had our first 90 degree day last weekend and so sharing with people from the kind of personal and storytelling perspective and translating some of the science I think is really important I would also say in terms of challenges, you know, like I mentioned before with the housing issue, a lot of the vulnerability lies in the existing housing stock and it's more expensive to upgrade and adapt and to meet people's health and safety needs in the existing housing stock than in new buildings. And it requires a larger investment and it's often also where the people with the lowest incomes are living. And so there's this great area of need where people have the least ability to upgrade and protect their own homes and it's cost the most. And with mobile homes in particular, with our program in Oak Ridge, we've seen cases where the EPA will not allow us to provide upgrades to those homes if the value of the upgrade exceeds the value of the home. And so I think we are going to get into the territory of needing to replace or build new housing. I mean, the housing issue here in Oregon and in the Northwest goes beyond heat, but I think thinking about these issues together and how we can find compounding benefits rather than only worrying about the compounding risks. And I think it really is gonna take a multidisciplinary bringing everyone into the same room and trying to think about these issues all at the same time. And that's the last thing I'll say is, you know, while he is extremely important, while I've been working with community-based organizations during this cooling needs study, I have heard from folks you know, heat's important, but we're working in communities that are recovering from wildfire or that are experiencing all these other issues. And, you know, people don't have the bandwidth to take another survey or to think about this when there's so many conflicting needs. And so really focusing on meeting people where they're at and trying to help people with all these basic needs that we're still lacking in a lot of our communities. Great, thank you both. Um, so we had another question that came in um, related to land access. And so kind of talks about how land access is, you know, a major issue, especially for low income populations who are not able to afford land. So um, this attendee was interested to know, you know, what are your organizations specifically doing, um, or maybe the folks you work with, um, you know, some of your partners to help some lower income people access land um, as it relates to urban agriculture and urban greening. Go ahead, and I'll turn it over to whoever wants to answer that. Um, I'm not currently working on anything specifically related to this, so I don't want to pretend to, to be able to speak to it too eloquently. Um, again, happy to follow up and if there, there are likely folks in our field that are working on it, but I will share another example kind of again with this issue that we're seeing around mobile and manufactured homes in Oak Ridge and statewide and looking at the need for replacing some of these older homes, particularly those built before 1976 when the building code started to get a little bit more helpful. And I think we're seeing there, you know, we're going to need to come up with some innovative financing models in order for lower income folks to be able to access a new home or a replacement. And we've been trying to pull together partners and work with all of the affordable housing providers and some of our community organizations and see what would it take to create a financing model where a low-income household could for example do like a rent to own model where they can start living in a new home right away and not have to have that hefty down payment in order to get into it and not have to absorb all of the risk so I think there's opportunity and some work being done but I wish that I had better examples to share because I know the need is really uh, present uh, we as a community, let us actually, uh, we know one of the big challenges is like for brownfields, especially buying the brownfields and redeveloping it. So we are collaborating with CBOs and nonprofits, and uh, we are trying to, as a multidisciplinary team and like our nexus, we are trying to collaborate with different uh, prospective, like bringing like real estate uh, developers, bringing 
community people bringing like government agencies together and like trying to help them to apply for available grants uh, so they can get the grant and provide more benefits for our communities by purchasing the land and redeveloping it to bring more community developers. But feel free to like, we have a great, as I mentioned, we have a great like community engagement uh, coordinator, feel free to reach out to me or like take a look at our website. You can like reach out to her and ask more specific questions from her as well. Thank you both. And we got a quick follow up on that question. And I assume Grace, this is, this is probably targeted towards you. This person asked about what about agricultural worker housing? Is there anything new on that as it relates to your work? Yeah, so for our cooling needs study that we're currently conducting, agricultural housing was not included in the original scope of work, but it's something that the state is interested in and that we amended to try and include into the work. Um, we're currently waiting for the legislation to see if we can get a deadline for the work and extend it over the summer when that would be. Um, it's, it's the best time and most relevant for folks when the agricultural season is happening here. So we're hoping that we'll be able to incorporate that into this project and if not, definitely recognize the need. I think regardless regardless of whether it's a particular focus area for the study, we're definitely going to have crossover just because the folks that are living in these housing types that are already included are also often ag agricultural workers and in the rural parts of the state. So we're going to get some exposure to it, but we're hoping to build um, and focus on it more specifically. And I think that's another area where there's these compounding impacts of smoke and heat when you're working outdoors and your home is not adequately cooled or filtered. And so there's a real need there for agricultural workers when we're talking about extreme weather. Great, right, thank you. So the next question kind of gets at both of y'all's, you know, perception of this problem. Um, so as someone who works in the field of climate adaptation, I kind of feel like extreme heat does not really get the attention that it deserves, maybe compared to other climate hazards, whether that's, you know, storms or sea level rise, things like that. And so I kind of wanted to see, is that the perception that you all have as well? And if it is, you know, why do you think that that is the case? Yeah, I feel like that's the case, but like, Comparing to the, when I started my research for extreme heat, like four years ago, these days we have more like news and stuff and more policies regarding the extreme heat. We even have a tools for extreme heat. We can see like more policies, grants to addressing the extreme heat. But I feel like the main problem is that if you, like with extreme heat, you are having more deaths, you are having more hazards and like heat illnesses but if you saw two pictures if flooding happens you will see the disaster for mm -hmm. afterward but with heat it's the same you are seeing the same street nothing changed for the infrastructure but we have like 10 people who died or who are suffering from heat because of the poor infrastructure and as I mentioned, like, I am like hoping, like moving forward, we will have more policies and like more actions regarding the extreme heat. And I feel like um, even like previously, like four or five years ago, when I was looking at the climate resilience planning stuff or climate action plan, most of them, they were lacking the extreme heat section. And I was like, wow. That was the wow. And since like I was like my research kind of was connected to the public health as well, even I want to share that that we have a gap of data in our public health departments. And I don't know if they recently changed it or not. Like I remember a year ago, there wasn't any code for heat related illnesses in the emergency visits. So that's why you can't get the valid data to show how many people died or suffered from heat because there isn't any code to record that. Anything to add there, Grace? 
Yeah, I think I, I would feel similarly that a lot of it is around kind of perception and how extreme heat feels and lands in communities compared to some of the more kind of extreme or acute feeling disasters. But I will say that in our experience in the communities we're working in and what we're seeing in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest, it is getting a lot more attention in these last couple of years, particularly since 2021 and the heat dome. But I think even before that, as we've had more heat waves and more extreme heat, it's definitely rising in attention. And I think similarly, for air quality, you know, wildfires have been considered disasters for quite some time. And we're trying to kind of help raise the awareness that the smoke is another equally or can be equally disastrous depending on what the impacts are in the community. And oftentimes the, pro the impacts from smoke are more prolonged. So I think, again, it's raising awareness and understanding about these impacts and also helping to empower communities and people to, to adapt and figure out what they can do about it. So it's not all so overwhelming bad news all the time. Definitely. Um, Ida, so the next question is for you. Um, I'm interested to know, are there other cities that you know about that um, are pursuing brownfield redevelopment, um, you know, for the sake of heat mitigation? And is Houston potentially interested in doing this on kind of a larger scale? Uh, actually, as I mentioned, I am a director of research, so I'm doing the research on impact, but my background is not kind of like focused on the brownfields. I'm working with brownfields, but we have specialists in our um, organization, community letters, so uh, I would like you to like get in touch with us and ask, but as far as I know, City of Pearson wants to have kind of a more like innovative wave to create a strategic plan for the brownfields and brownfield redevelopment. So in me, as part of the research team and community leaders who work with City of Houston to develop and update their strategic plan for the brownfields, we are considering their resilience metric and extreme heat mitigation strategies. So we want to create a model that other cities can use as well in their brownfield redevelopments. Great, thank you. So we just got a follow-up question to her previous question about um, kind of the attention that uh, extreme heat gets. And so <clears throat> this question says, regarding um, to growing attention to heat waves, can you be a little more specific about what is getting more attention? Um, is it direct human impacts, costs, public activities to respond to heat events? So I guess when um, engaging the public, like what are the things that you all are seeing um, that, that gain the public's attention? Grace, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's a little, I think, I'll answer in a couple of ways. So on the one hand, I think in terms of what we're seeing, when I say that we're seeing an increase in this regarding heat waves in Oregon, it's really around kind of legislative priorities and what organizations and, and governments and our partners at that level are looking at and focusing on and putting funding towards, as well as I think communicating in the news and the media, like here's the impacts and here's what happened and what you want to know. I think in terms of communicating to people and to the public, what I've seen and what I think is, is helpful right now is more about the education piece of what people need to know about heat, what temperatures might be, you know, too hot, what resources exist, and helping people to kind of understand the behavior and culture around heat and what is and isn't safe for them and their families. So I think there's a couple different threads of messaging happening depending on who the audience is and, and where we're at. Yeah, <laughs> I I totally agree with Grace, but most of the recent like research that I was attending is affecting people's real life and their health. So, and it's like kind of the saying that they feel in their daily life. Uh, when I was talking about like thermal comfort, most people maybe they don't have any idea about like thermal comfort. Thermal comfort is the feeling that you are having in a specific place in a specific time. So people who are using the public infrastructure and like using the public transportation, they are trying to use the parks and like whenever they are going out, 
they feel that and like I, I had people who were asking me you know, I was collecting the data microclimatic data to analyze for the thermal comfort in streetcar stops in Tucson they were asking me if I'm coming from like city if I am someone from city and I was like curious asking why you are asking this because they were asking me please ask them to do something about heat and like bring more shades add more trees there are different pictures like even like most of the stops because it's just not stops even like parks are public space we have not proper design for the extreme heat and people are feeling that the person who was like playing in the same park for example 20 years ago right now have a kid who can't go out and play because it's really hot and it's dangerous for their kid okay so i think i'm going to wrap up our session with one final kind of process-based question um so both grace and ida your work that you've described involves many different fields so whether that's kind of climate adaptation mitigation public health climate modeling policy so i kind of wanted to dig into like what does that actually look like in practice for you all you know how do you bring together people with all those different expertise how do you kind of get them on the same page um, to kind of work towards you know some of these goals um, and you know achieve uh, progress on extreme heat so i'd be kind of interested to know more about that and whoever wants to go first yeah for me like collaborative research is a thing so having a collaborative team it's really important and when we are talking about like collaborative process it means that from beginning until end you will involve different people from policy decision maker stakeholders community members and as i mentioned in my presentation i believe that cities are for people who are living in that city so if we are creating any space for them if we are trying to do anything we want to ask them what they need and we want to ask their needs and issues to address that with like community engagement with follow-up meetings and in the work that we are doing currently with community letters i enjoyed working with them because our main focus is like community and social justice we are trying to consider community and what community needs in every single steps and we are trying to create that connection between like community stakeholders like city of Houston as I mentioned in those uh, like I think like a question before this like city of Houston is kind of creating the innovation framework and uh, it's like in this framework we had different like uh, community engagement workshop and stuff and we use all of the feedback from like all people all around the Houston Texas to address or those needs and like consider like mix and match like science and like community feedback and community engagement and needs I think that's the best way to address all of the issues and like informing the decision maker is really important you need to have the art of communicating science and uh, the art is really important as i mentioned if you are showing graphs and diagrams and you are saying a general public you will have 100 days more than like 100 degrees in the future they can't understand that you need to like talk in a way that everyone can understand like that's the art of communication that can help you to mitigate any kind of climate hazards and risks. Yeah, I would add to what Ida shared. I think it really is all about collaboration and multidisciplinary teams. So within our practice and our work, we, we have experts in different fields and we bring together a lot of different practices. And then we go beyond that to really emphasize collaborating and working in community and with community. So I think a lot of our work is centered around those partnerships with community-based organizations and building trusted relationships over time. The work we're doing in Oak Ridge now, the targeted airshed grants from the EPA are spanning a seven-year timeline, and that is 
building on many years of work prior to build capacity, build resources, apply for funding, and kind of work with all the different partners, bringing the local health clinic and the, the county health providers and the state of Oregon Health Department all together, bringing together the forest service and the forest experts and really looking at how can we look at smoke and health from a multi-disciplinary, multi-faceted level. And it takes many partners and players in many different seats and fields and no one partner or organization can do it alone. So it's really the beauty of you know, being able to invest long term and build that capacity and uh, knowing who to bring to the table and when. And so I think that's our aim is to always figure out who we can work with and how we can try and help get capacity and resources to the areas where they're, they're needed and where we can build upon it. Excellent. Thank you so much to both of you for taking the time today to share with us um, your expertise. Um, this was an amazing conversation and um, you know, I think there's still so much that we could have gone into today. Um, I've shared a slide here at the end for our attendees. Um, my colleague Catherine is also gonna be sharing this survey link. Um, we would love to hear feedback that anyone has about this session, the series as a whole, um, and as a thank you for taking um, this survey, you can be entered in to win um, a $20 Visa gift card. Um, and again, the recording from this session will be posted to our website um, before the end of the week. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, we have uh, our email posted at our website, and I want to once again thank Ida and Grace for taking the time today um, and for sharing their expertise with us. Thank you, Carrie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.